Howie Hawkins officially has become the presumptive nominee for the Green Party. He's been endorsed by the Socialist Party of America, and he campaigned for initiatives like the Green New Deal as early as 2010. His running mate is Angela Walker, a former Socialist Party vice presidential nominee, and Howie joins us now via Skype to share more about his campaign for the presidency. Welcome to the show. Good to see you, Howie. Good to be here. Thanks. By this record, I mean, he, as a senator in a Judiciary Committee, shepherded through Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas. He was central to the architecture of the mass incarceration state. He was for a balanced budget. He was with the DLC, the Democrats for the leisure class, as Jesse Jackson used to call him. He was central to that. That's his whole record. He's a war hawk. He's a fiscal hawk. He's not with the people. So, you know, this is an opportunity for people to vote for what they want. You know, Bernie Sanders gave voice to a sentiment that's been there, the polls show, since Truman. And that is for a national health insurance program, Medicare for all. And uh, he moved the debate on that. And we want to do the same thing on all these economic rights, on peace initiatives, and on a serious climate action program. I mean, while we're worried about the coronavirus, you know, it's over 100 degrees in one of the coldest places on Earth up in Siberia right now. We're in big trouble. So we yeah. got to have real solutions and real solutions can't wait. When you vote for Biden, they don't know you're a Sanders progressive. You voted for Biden and what he stands for. And he said he told Sanders in the last debate, you know, Medicare for all is irrelevant to the coronavirus crisis. I mean, if that's what you want to vote for, fine. But it's not what you were voting for when you voted for Bernie Sanders. In the first two years of the Obama administration, nearly 800,000 immigrants were deported, far more than during President Trump's first two years. Would the higher deportation rates resume if you're president? Absolutely not, number one. Number two, everything landed on the president's desk but locusts. I found that, Julian, excuse me, the secretary, we sat together in many meetings. I never heard him talk about any of this when he was the secretary. Please be respectful. Please be respectful in the crowd. Please continue, Mr. Vice President. The fact is, the fact is, it's personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. Senator Kamala Harris claimed today she was not surprised by anything that came her way last night. Not even this. She put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place that impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Now, Harris may not have been surprised by the specific accusations, but she didn't have specific replies. And Gabbard didn't make those allegations up. They're not unsupported. A lot of them come from an op-ed that was written by somebody who used to work with Senator Harris. I wanted to return back to this issue of, of black voters. I, I have a lifetime of experience with black voters. I've been one since I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody on this stage should need a focus group to hear from African-American voters. Uh, black voters are pissed off and they're worried. They're pissed off because the only time our issues seem to be really paid attention to by politicians is when people are looking for their vote. And they're worried because the Democratic Party, we don't want to uh, see people miss this opportunity and lose because we are nominating someone that doesn't, isn't trusted, doesn't have authentic connection. And so that's what's on the ballot and issues do matter. I, I have a lot of respect uh, for, for the vice president. He has uh, swore me into my office as a hero. This week, I hear him literally say that I don't think we should legalize marijuana. I, 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 I thought you might have been high when you said it. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, because, because marijuana, 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 
marijuana in our country is already legal for privileged people. And it's one, the war on drugs has been a war on black and brown people. And so let me just, let me just say this. With more African Americans under criminal supervision in America than all the slaves since 1850, do not roll up into communities and not talk directly to issues that are going to relate to the liberation of children because there are people in Congress right now that admit to smoking marijuana while there are people, our kids are in jail right now for those drug crimes. And so these are the kind of issues that mean a lot to our community. And if we don't have somebody authentically, we lost the last election. Let me just give you this data example. We lost Quickly. in, in Wisconsin because of a massive diminution, a lot of reasons, but there was a massive diminution in the African American vote. Vice President Biden, as a presidential candidate in 2008, you supported the border wall saying, unlike most Democrats, I voted for 700 miles of fence. This is what you said. Then you serve as vice president in an administration that deported three million people, the most ever in U.S. history. Did you do anything to prevent those deportations? I mean, you've been asked this question before and refused to answer, so let me try once again. Are, are, are you prepared to say tonight that you and President Obama made a mistake about deportations? Why should Latinos trust you? What Latinos should look at is Comparing this president to the president we have is outrageous, number one. We didn't lock people up in cages. We didn't separate families. We didn't do all of those things. But yeah, but you, you didn't answer the question. Well, the question I, I is, did you, make question. A, no, did you make a mistake with those deportations? The president did the best thing that was able to be done at the How about time. you? I'm the Vice President of the United States. Uh, Secretary Castro, uh, would you want to respond I, I to mean, Vice look, President Biden? You know, and and let, let me put this in context, because uh, your party controlled the White House and Congress in 2009 and didn't pass immigration reform. And this broke a promise made by President Barack Obama to Latinos. So why should voters trust Democrats now? My problem with Vice President Biden, and Corey pointed this out last time, is every time something good about Barack Obama comes up, he says, oh, I was there, I was there, I was there. That's me too. And then every time somebody questions part of the administration that we were both part of, he says, well, that was the president. I mean, he wants to take credit for Obama's work, but not have to answer to any questions. I mean. Bye. Vice President Biden, you have a... I don't get that. You have, have you been on the floor of the Senate? You were in the Senate for a few years. Yeah. Time and time again, talking about the necessity, with pride, about cutting Social Security, cutting Medicare, cutting veterans programs. No. You never said that? No. All right. America, go to the website right now. Go to the YouTube right now. Time after time, you were not a fan of Bo Simpson? I was not a fan of both. You were not a fan of the balanced budget amendment which called for cuts in Social Security? Come on, look, Joe, you won't. Look, here's the deal. You're an honest guy. Why don't you just tell the truth here? We all I, make mistakes. I, I am telling the truth. When I introduced the budget freeze years ago, the liberals of my party said, it's an awful thing you're doing, Joe. You are all the programs we care about. You're freezing them. Money for the blind, the disabled, education, and so on. And my argument then is the one I make now, which is the strongest, most compelling reason to be for this, but this amendment or an amendment. And that is that if we don't do that, all the things I care most about are going to be gone. I mean, whatever happened to that old conservative discipline about paying for what you spend? I'm up for re-election this year, and I'm going to remind everybody what I did at home, which is going to cost me politically. I, when I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Joe, let me repeat it again. I want you just to be straight with the American people. I am saying that you have been on the floor of the Senate time and time again, talking about the need to cut Social Security, Medicare, and veterans programs. Is that true or is that no, not true? No, it's not true. What that is, is not true? That is not true. What is true is, in terms of the negotiations that are taking place, how to deal with the deficit, everything was on the table. I did not support any of those cuts. 
in Social Security or in veterans. Whoa, benefits. whoa, whoa. You, you, everything was on the table. All right, you're right. You just said it, including, in your judgment, cuts to Social Security and veterans. In order to get the kinds of changes we need on other okay. things related. Joe, then but you just. But we did not cut it. I, I know, because people like me helped stop that. Senator, we have a deficit. We have Social Security and Medicare looming. Would you consider looking at those programs, age of eligibility, absolutely. cost of living, put it all on the table? The answer is absolutely. You have to. I mean, you know, it's the, one of the things that my, you know, the, the political advisors say to me is, whoa, don't touch that third. Look, the American people aren't stupid. It's a real simple proposition. Social Security is not the hard one to solve. Medicare, that is the gorilla in the room. And you've got to put all of it on the table. Everything. Everything. You've got to. Joining us now via Skype to discuss the ongoing Social Security fight is Huffington Post reporter Daniel Marins, who has been following this story closely. Great to see you, sir. Great to be here. Can you just kind of lay out the facts of Joe Biden's record, what he's said, what seems to be his position in the past versus today, et cetera? Because no one's followed this closer than you have. Daniel, we've basically seen Biden come out and say that this is a lie. It's a distortion of his record. I mean, you've looked at his record now. Uh, what do you say? Well, it, it's definitely not a lie. I, I think mm -hmm. that here, here, here's the thing. When we say that Biden has said it's a distortion of his record, he's, he's seized on very technical aspects of things that the Sanders team has sometimes presented. So there's the case of remarks he made at Brookings where it sounded like he was expressing sympathy for Paul Ryan, but then he sort of turns around and says, well, Paul Ryan wanted to privatize it. I never wanted to privatize it. And the video they released didn't have the full context. Here's the facts. In 1984, he supported a full-on spending freeze that would have affected every government program, including the ability for uh, Social Security to continue to uh, grow with inflation. In 1995, he voted for the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, which only narrowly was defeated. It needed two-thirds majority in the Senate to pass. It was narrowly defeated. He was very proud of that vote. He boasted about it for years afterward. In 2007, he told an interviewer, Social Security uh, benefits need to be on the table. And then, of course, during the Obama administration, just as Bill Clinton wanted to show his seriousness through welfare reform, Barack Obama wanted to show his seriousness by cutting uh, Social Security's cost of living adjustment. And Biden was very much uh, involved in those talks, those efforts to forge a grand bargain with the Republicans then controlling Congress. Yeah. I think that's such that's, a great point. You don't have to go back to the 90s, you know, to find his comments on this. You can see his support for this idea even under the Obama administration. We need economic justice. We just released our Economic Bill of Rights something that Roosevelt called for in his last state of, two State of the Union addresses, 1944 and 45, picked up by the Civil Rights Movement, and the Democrats have had a president with both houses of Congress, and they've secured none of these rights, which include a job guarantee, an income above poverty, affordable housing, comprehensive health care, lifelong public education, and a secure retirement. And this is a big issue because it's a life or death issue. Working class life expectancies are declining in this country. And then, of course, the Green New Deal is about climate action, <clears throat> as well as economic recovery. Uh, we're going to need it in this coronavirus depression. So we, we've got a program to get to 100 percent clean energy and zero to negative carbon emissions by 2030. And then the third big issue is uh, this new nuclear arms race. The bullets in the atomic scientists has their doomsday clock, the closest it's ever been to midnight. None of the major presidential candidates have talked about this issue. The last bilateral treaty between the United States and Russia is about to expire next February 5th. That's strategic arms. It's a, a life and death issue as well. So we have peace initiatives. We want to cut the military budget 75 percent, bring our troops home, pledge no first use of nuclear weapons, and then go to the other nuclear powers and say it's time for a complete and mutual nuclear disarmament with the support of the 122 nations that three years ago agreed to the text of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So those have been our top three issues. Now we got a new life and death issue, and that's the coronavirus. Hmm. And Trump, I mean, Trump gave up. He's a loser. He says, coronavirus, you win. We're moving on. And meanwhile, tens of thousands of people are dying. So, and I don't know where Biden is. He should be calling for a test, trace, and quarantine like every other organized country in the world. Senator Harris, you have also been quite critical of Vice President, Vice President Biden's policies um, on race, specifically on the issue of busing in the 1970s, having benefited from busing uh, when you were uh, a young child. Vice President Biden says that your current position on busing, 
you're opposed to federally mandated busing, that that position is the same as his position. Is he right? That is simply false. And let's be very clear about this. When Vice President Biden was in the United States Senate working with segregationists to oppose busing, which was the vehicle by which we would integrate America's public schools, had I been in the United States Senate at that time, I would have been completely on the other side of the aisle. And let's be clear about this. Had those segregationists their way, I would not be a member of the United States Senate, Cory Booker would not be a member of the United States Senate, and Barack Obama would not have been in the position to nominate him to the title he now holds. And so, on that issue, we could not be more apart, which is that the Vice President has still failed to acknowledge that it was wrong to take the position that he took at that time. Vice Gations. President Biden, I want to like, give you a chance to respond to what Senator Harris just said. When Senator Harris was the Attorney General for eight years in the state of California, there were two of the most segregated school districts in the country, in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. And she did not, I, I didn't see a single solitary time she brought a case against them to desegregate them. Secondly, she also was in a situation where she had a police department when she was there that in fact was abusing people's rights. And the fact was that she, in fact, was told by her own people that her own staff, that she should do something about and disclose to defense attorneys like me that you, in fact, have been, I mean, the police officer did something that did not give you information that would exculpate your, your, your uh, client. She didn't do that. She never did it. And so what happened? Along came a federal judge and said, enough, enough, and he freed Thank a you. thousand of these people. If you doubt me, Google a thousand prisoners freed Kamala Harris. Thank you, uh, Vice President Biden. And Senator Harris, your response? That is, this is simply not true. And as Attorney General of California, where I ran the second largest Department of Justice in the United States, second only to the United States Department of Justice, I am proud of the work we did, work that has received national recognition for what has been the important work of reforming a criminal justice system and cleaning up the consequences of the bills that you passed when you were in the United States Senate for decades. <laughs> It was the work of creating the one of the first in the nation initiatives around re-entering former offenders and getting them jobs and counseling. Thank you, I did the work as attorney general of putting body you, cameras on special I agents bring in, in the state of California, Ga I, and I'm I wanna, proud of that work. I want to bring in Congresswoman Gabbard. Congresswoman Gabbard, you took issue with Senator Harris confronting Vice President Biden at the last debate. You called it a quote false accusation that Joe Biden is a racist. What's your response? I want to bring the conversation back to the broken criminal justice system that is disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown people all across this country today. Now, Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president, but I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place. That impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Senator Harris, your response. As the elected Attorney General of California, I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. And I am proud of making a decision to not just give fancy speeches or be in a legislative body and give speeches on the floor, but actually doing the work of being in the position to use the power that I had to reform a system that is badly in need of reform. That is why we created initiatives that were about re-entering former offenders and getting them counseling. Thank it is you. why, and because I know that criminal justice Thank system you, is Senator. so broken, that I am an advocate for what Thank we you, need Senator. to do to not your, only your decriminalize, but legalize marijuana in the United States. I want to I want to bring uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard back in. Your response. The bottom line is, Senator Harris, when you were in a position to make a difference and an impact in these people's lives, you did not, and worse yet, in the case of those who were on death row, innocent people, you actually blocked evidence from being revealed that would have freed them until you were forced to do so. There is no excuse for that, and the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor owe 
you owe them an apology. Let's bring in the Hawaii Congresswoman. Good to have you on primetime. Aloha, Chris. Good to talk to you. Good to see you. So I want to talk to you about um, how you took and why you seemed obviously dissatisfied with uh, the senator's answers last night. Why do you think Senator Harris didn't have specific responses for you last night? And what do you think last night means to you going forward? That's a great question that I wish someone would ask Senator Harris. If she and comes on the show, I'll ask her, I only... promise, Congresswoman. As soon as she's here, I it'll be the first thing out of will. my mouth. I believe that you will, because she didn't give any answers, not just to me, but to the American people last night on that debate stage. And in the interviews that she had uh, after the debate, uh, she again refused to address this record that she had as attorney general that she claims to be so proud of. A lot of concerns and a lot of issues raised there. This isn't personal. It's really about making sure that the American people have the truth, because that's what this process is all about. It's about understanding how critical the decision is that's before us and the kind of leadership that we seek to bring. Do you think she has good answers to those questions? If she has, she's failed to present them. I think the fact that the answers she's chosen to give has nothing to do with she, she will not address the concerns raised regarding her record that she's said she's proud of. Frankly, that has caused more harm and more pain and suffering to people in California during that time and how instead of using her position of power to be that force for positive change, to be a champion for the people that she claims to be, instead she used it to further oppress people in an, in an already broken criminal justice system. What is your view on the police reform debate and what the federal government could do? Well, we've been talking about defunding the police, which means redirecting some of those resources to social services that can handle the problem better than the police. Like, if you're homeless, instead of charging them with vag vagrancy, how about we find them a home? So that's good, but there's not enough budget money in the police budgets. We need a major federal investment in these communities that have been segregated and discriminated against and exploited for generations. And that's where our Green New Deal comes in, because we'll have a major investment in public housing, mass transit, a job guarantee, an income guarantee. Those kinds of things will help those communities rise up. So that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, it's one thing to tinker with police practices like chokeholds, uh, but it's another to make the police uh, accountable to the community. We need community control of the police. The big problem in why the police get away with murder and other crimes is that they police themselves. That doesn't work. So we need police commissions that have the power to hire and fire the police chief, uh, clean the force of the racists and the sadists, uh, negotiate contracts so they don't provide special shields to misconduct, uh, look over the budgets and the practices and have the ability to investigate and discipline officers for misconduct. Then they're working for us instead of themselves. Mr. Vice President, there's a saying in my community, you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. Uh, you, need to, you need to come to the city of Newark and see the reforms that we put in place. Sir, you are trying to shift the you from what you created. There are people right now in prison for life for drug offenses, because you stood up and used that tough on crime, phony rhetoric that got a lot of people elected, but destroyed communities like mine. This isn't about the past, sir. This is about the present right now. I believe in Thank redemption. You, I'm happy you evolved. I want to bring in but Secretary. But you offered no redemption to the people in wanna, prison right now. I want to bring life. in Secretary Castro. Your response, sir? Yeah, well, I agree with Senator Booker that, uh, I agree with Senator Booker that a lot of uh, what uh, Vice President um, helped author in 94 was a mistake. And he has flip-flopped on these things, and that's clear. But let me say, when we talk about criminal justice reform, there are a lot of things that we can talk about, sentencing reform, cash bail reform, investing in public defenders, diversion programs. We have a police system that is broken, and we need to fix it. And whether it's uh, the case of someone like Tamir Rice or Michael Brown uh, or Eric Garner, where the Trump Justice Department just decided not to pursue charges, we need to ensure we have a national use of force standard and that we end qualified immunity for police officers so that we can hold them accountable. Well, Mr. Vice President, it looks like one of us has learned the lessons of the past and one of us hasn't. 